Jonathan brought us an excellent sermon, a very brief period of time and quite thorough on Wednesday evening regarding why New Testament Christians do not observe the birthday of Christ. And to sum up basically what he says is we don't know, first of all, when he was born, but that's not the reason. We simply do not have authority in the New Testament for us to do such. We have preached and will continue to preach as long as we can that whatsoever you do in word or in deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That behooves us to understand how the New Testament of our Lord and Savior authorizes us to do anything. And our responsibility in right dividing the word of truth to be able to search out His authority for our lives. And in the process of Jonathan going through that lesson, he mentioned briefly what we are to do in memory of Christ, and that is that we are to remember his death. I find it quite interesting that the Bible says very clearly, remember his death, and here's how you do it, and here's when you do it. And men dismiss it. But where he doesn't say anything, there is all sorts of elaborate stuff going on. And it simply comes down to where the problem has always been. It's in the song that Frank Sinatra sang, I Did It My Way. It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. Cain did it his way. Hebrews 11 and 4 says, It was by faith that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And by it he obtained a good report, and he being dead yet speaketh. Well, I'd like to listen to him because God was pleased with what he offered. Now, what I want to do, since he said that, and we know what next Saturday is in this world, as far as religious things are concerned, I would like to spend time on emphasizing just what the Bible says concerning Remembering Christ, and it is to remember His death. And that raises the question, what is the Lord's Supper? What is the Lord's Supper? Simply put, it's an act of worship. In which Christians, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, engage in the assembly of worship, an assembly convened on the first day of the week, made up of Christians, to show forth the death of Christ till He come. Now there are other acts of worship, and to have the one complete first day of the week worship, then all five acts must be engaged in. Now, the New Testament refers to the Lord's Supper as communion in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. We may say more about that a little later. And it speaks of breaking of bread in Acts uh, chapter 2, 42. We'll say more about that later. Now, when you look around about you, especially Roman Catholicism, you'll see it's called the Eucharist. You may wonder why. Because uh, of the Greek word, eucharisteo, which simply means giving thanks. So they call it that, but I don't know why that applies to that more than it does anything else, because Jesus gave thanks to a number of things, so it sees no reason, or I see no reason scripturally to apply it to that. Just because we give thanks for something doesn't mean we call it that. Because the Bible has more to say to what it is, about what it is, than that. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, He did give thanks for the bread. And He did give thanks for the fruit of the vine, Matthew 26, 26 through 27. And you'll see that it's a simple act of worship. 
And when we observe it, we do so by eating of the unleavened bread in memory of the body of Christ that he offered as sacrifice for our sins on the cross of Calvary. In fact, for the sins of the whole world. And we drink the fruit of the vine because it represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. I said some time ago in a sermon on worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that under the Old Testament, they had to have the right attitude of heart to approach God. And they had to do it as the law of Moses taught them. So worshiping God in spirit and in truth has to be more than what they did. And it simply means that the Old New Testament system is on a much higher plane spiritually than was the law of Moses, a system of carnal ordinances of drinks and sacrifices and so on. And you'll see it focused in as we come to this act of worship known as the Lord's Supper because it strictly allows each person according to their growth and development as a Christian as much as they have the power to do so to focus on their Lord's death. So I say again, it's one of the five important acts of worship in which Christians engage in the first day of the week worship assembly. And as is true of the other four acts of worship, we must understand why we observe the supper. If we don't, we find out it would be meaningless to us and thereby displeasing to God. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, we find it would actually be detrimental to us. And who, who's, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. We'll say more about that in a moment. So the first day of the week, worship assembly, and what's done in it, and the attitude of the people worshiping, is one of the fundamentals of the faith. Furthermore, the observance of the Lord's Supper as I said earlier, is really a component, one component part of the singular complete worship on the, of the first day of the week worship assembly. Let me emphasize, and I'll probably do this throughout the sermon, that it is authorized to be partaken of within the worship assembly on the first day of the week. And all Christians must, especially those new in the faith, be well acquainted with the meaning and practice of the Lord's Supper. So first we answer the question, what is the meaning of the Supper? You know, we are a people who have memorials. There are various things that cause us, help us to remember I have my daddy's dog tags that he wore from the time he was in the service through the North African campaign of World War II and into Italy and until the end of the war. I see that, and it's just simply a help to remember what he did. I also have his Eisenhower jacket. It never leaves a cedar chest, <laughs> and that he helped me do the same thing. It also reminds me of how small he was when he was 18. <clears throat> but they, their age, they, they help us to engage the mind. <clears throat> and that's what we're doing when we worship in spirit and in truth. And yet it's a simple thing, a memorial. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. Paul writes to the church at Corinth who were abusing the Lord's Supper. And he says to them, I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Paul, where did you get what you're about to write? From the Lord. Here's what he received of the Lord, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, 
This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I want to stop there. We eat the bread in memory of the body of Christ. And it's unleavened bread. It was made out of, that is, the Lord's Supper was instituted out of the product of the Passover feast. Unleavened bread means no leavening. It was to indicate purity. The Jews in observance of the Passover would sweep their houses clean of any leaven. There would be none on the premises. Thus the pure body of Christ is remembered that it was a sinless body that was offered on Calvary's cross. Notice the simplicity of it, yet look what it brings to mind. And we drink the cup, the fruit of the vine, in memory of His blood. His blood shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. Life is in the blood. When He shed His blood, He gave His life for us. We therefore commemorate the death of Jesus on the cross. Matthew 26, 28. And we need to understand that it was the death of Christ on the cross that made the new covenant, the New Testament, possible. That's the reasoning done by the inspired writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 9, verse 16. And Ephesians 1, 7 says clearly that Christ's blood was shed for the remission of sin. Now, the Jews should have been educated for this because as the Passover was a memorial commemorating Israel's deliverance from Egypt through the blood of the lambs on the doorposts and so on, so the Lord's Supper is a simple but powerful memorial to our Lord's death who makes our deliverance from the bondage of sin possible. This helps us with our mind, doesn't it? It's to where it ought to be when we observe the Lord's Supper. But notice the simplicity of it. And notice how it allows the most mature, experienced, faithful child of God to put into it as much as his faithfulness and years of service can put into it, as well as the person who is a newborn baby in Christ. And it allows for all that growth and development over the years. And it's still an expression of the death of Christ. The Lord's Supper is a proclamation. 1 Corinthians 11, 26, the first part of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. For as often as you do it, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. I recognize people say almost anything because they're not cautious and careful with the Word of God and what it says and what it means. And I see it on Facebook. Well, the Lord's Supper shows forth the life of Christ. Does not. There's nothing in the Bible says it does. It shows the death of Christ. Because that's what He went through to save me from my sins. That's what it focuses on. There's not a thing in the Lord's Supper that focuses on anything but the very death of Jesus Christ and what it means to you and what it means to me, or should, because His death was indeed for our sins. If we don't believe He died for our sins, why keep the supper? You notice also we proclaim our faith in the Lord's return. What's, what's said about that? Until He comes. How long should we partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week in the worship assembly of the saints? Simple answer, until He come. That's not hard. I hope it's registering on all of us, and certainly it has on most of us already, of the simplicity of this memorial feast. If we don't believe it's coming again, why keep the supper? So the Lord's Supper looks forward as well as backward. It all centers in upon His death. It's to be observed by faithful children of God who trust in His redemption and they look forward to His return when our eternal redemption 
And a glorified body in heaven with Christ will be a reality. Now, I said earlier we'd talk a little more about communion, and the Lord's Supper is a communion. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, the first part of verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Then he says, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? A fellowship or sharing in the blood of Christ is emphasized here. So as we partake, what's he saying? We commune with the blood of Christ. How? We know what it means for us to remember what it represents and how it impacts us. This is the reason it does take mental discipline to focus in on what God says you ought to be focusing in on in this aid to memory of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And I think certainly we could say that it reinforces the great blessings that Christians enjoy through the blood of Christ. For example, in 1 John 1 and 7, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. Then He says if we sin and we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's also a fellowship in the sharing or sharing, I guess we'd say, for such is a fundamental meaning of fellowship, in the body of Christ. You get the same idea presented in 1 Corinthians 10, I read a moment ago, latter part of 16 and in verse 17. Because as we partake, we commune with the body of Christ. What does it mean? What does it mean? It's the sacrifice offered for us. A sacrifice is giving up something tremendously important. Christ gave His life. He gave His body, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. So John could say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Every bullock, every lamb, every dove, every pigeon. And they were offered by the thousands upon thousands during that 1,500 years. The flesh of the Israel approaching God under the law of Moses. Every one of them pointed to that singular Christ on the cross. And as we commune with the body of Christ, we are strengthened in our fellowship because we are the spiritual body of Christ, the church of the living God. Certainly, according to one's spiritual growth and development, as I've said, this is at least for the third time in this lesson, each Christian will engage in and appreciate and benefit from the supper of our Lord. We need to also consider the observance of this supper. Surely we've gathered this already, but we say it for emphasis sake. We are to observe it with reverence and godly fear. Now this is where it takes us back to 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 29. Because he warns us there. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread... And drink this cup of the Lord, King James, unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. You look at the new King James, it's going to say, in a worthy manner. If you don't do it in a worthy manner, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 29. I say again, the old King James says, worthily. And a lot of folks have misunderstood that. I was exposed to that. I think I've been all my life with brethren not having that in their mind. What you have is an adverb describing how, how we take it. Not whether we are worthy, because nobody truly is worthy. But he's talking about, because that was the problem there in Corinth, one of them, of their abuse and misuse of partaking the Lord's Supper. Their manner of doing it was not right. And that's what he's talking about. 
Thus, unworthily means in an unworthy manner. With respect for the supreme price Jesus paid for our sins. The cruel torture. The terrible shame he underwent. The humiliation of his physical body. Why? So I could have forgiveness of sins. The spiritual anguish that he suffered as he bore the punishment for your sin and mine. Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthana. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was the sacrifice for sin. He bore it on his shoulders, as it were. And he had to tread the wine press alone. Failure to observe with proper reverence and godly fear brings condemnation on every one of us. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Now, let me pause here and say this. This is emphasizing the teaching of the New Testament on the Lord's Supper and its observance. But brethren, listen. The disposition of mind that ought to be in a person to partake of the Lord's Supper correctly ought to be when it comes to our prayers and when it comes to studying the Bible and when it comes to our singing and so on. The reverence and godly fear that ought to be within a congregation as they've assembled, convened to engage in the worship of God and obedience to their Lord. Now, let me pause here and say, what have you seen over the last number of years? It's been the denominations for a long time. People try to make the worship assembly a three-ring circus. Does this sound like the proper atmosphere and spiritual environment God intended among the spiritual children of God to worship Him? We've missed it by a million miles. And wouldn't we think the devil would want it to be that way? Whatever God wants done this way and sets it out in his word, you can be sure the counterfeit of the devil will appear. Failure to observe with proper reverence brings condemnation. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 29. That makes us guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And we're actually turning what should be tremendous in its strength and as an act of worship into an episode of our eating and drinking damnation to ourselves. To partake of this memorial feast without reverence, sobriety, and purpose of thought in the worship assembly of the saints where the Lord located it puts one in the same category as those who mock Christ while he hanged upon the cross. We're to therefore observe it with self-examination. Among other things Christians should be reflecting is, of course then, is self-examination is your spiritual condition. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28 reads, but Let a man examine himself, and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Are we living in a manner that shows deep appreciation for our Lord's sacrifice? By accepting the favor of God, the grace of God in our lives. Paul deals with that back earlier, or I should say in the next letter, early in it in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through chapter 6, 1. And then it makes us examine ourselves, ask ourselves, am I living like Jesus teaches in the New Testament? Because he died for me. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. Or are we willfully sinning? And we know we're in sin and we refuse to repent. Thus we're guilty of having trampled the Son of God's foot. Counted the blood by which we were sanctified an unholy thing. And we do despite or insult the Spirit of grace. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. All of that happens when we don't worship God in spirit and in truth and know what that means. And we're applying it now to the observance of the Lord's Supper. Do we, by refusing to repent of our sins, end up crucifying 
again for ourselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. In one sense, you see how the supper itself and its observance is a very private matter between a Christian and his or her God. It's a time to reflect on the past and resolve the future. It's a time of encouragement and strength. It's a time of self-examination. As you do this in memory of me, as Christ said. The Lord's Supper is to be observed with other Christians. I do not know where my brethren ever came up with the idea that one act of worship could be singled out, and when you do that, you're all right. And yet I've watched brethren all my life do that kind of thing. Done my best, to try to show people. That's not what the New Testament teaches. But people can frown upon the denominations not abiding by the authority of Christ, but you can't see that we ought to do what he said and the way he said it, well, the reason he said it when it comes to the Lord's Supper as well as any other thing. There's ample indication the supper is designed to be a communal meal, meal, feast. I don't mean to feed your body, but communal. Disciples came together to break bread, Acts 27. It's not hard to understand. They came together to break bread. When they came together, they were to tarry or wait for one another, 1 Corinthians 11.33. When brethren divide up the worship assembly, they have no authority to do that. We're to do all this together. We just don't appreciate togetherness, as the Bible teaches it, especially brethren. Partaking together of one bread, what do they do? Well, at least one thing they do is demonstrate they are one bread and one body. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17. And I cannot help but emphasize the following. We must, must, it's imperative to remember that Christians commune not just with the Lord, but with one another. The New Testament authority that we have for the observance of the Lord's Supper places that observance not only on the first day of every week, but within the worship assembly, not out of it. I don't know where that came from, but it didn't come from God. Therefore, it came from the devil. Give it back to him. We have no New Testament authority to offer the Lord's Supper to anyone outside the worship assemblies of the local church. If you could do that, then why don't we just do it at home? Not even have a worship assembly. Because surely if you have a godly home, then the father and the mother of that home know what's best for everybody in that home. So why do it in assembly? You do away with the assembly. And yet we're taught not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. So there must be an assembly that's authorized and we're expected to be there. And in that assembly do what God located to be done in that assembly. And we must not forget that the supper builds fellowship with one another as well as with the Lord. It's to be done often, as often as you do this. But the question is, how often? Well, when you have an apostle who taught brethren in a big hurry, but he waits seven days because he knows the church is faithful is going to assemble on the first day of the week to break bread. And you have apostolic example, you have an apostolic uh, authority, Acts 20 and 7 then that becomes an account of an action of the first century church that must be followed as you carry out. How often? How often? Well, Paul, how often? Well, let me give you an example. Church of Troas. I knew the church would convene on the first day of the week before they were authorized to do so. I knew why they were coming together. A big hurry to get to Jerusalem, but I waited seven days so they came together. Because you see, as an apostle of Christ speaking in Christ's stead, I taught them that's what they were to do, and I'm going to participate in that which is authorized, and we all participate together. Paul wouldn't have participated in something that was contrary to God's will. Other indications of a weekly observance are found in 1 Corinthians, as I said, 11, 17 through 22. They were coming, that is the church at Corinth, was coming together to eat the Lord's Supper, 
I know they were abusing it, but in their minds, that's what they were doing, and Paul had to correct them on their abuses. And also, you see 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, regarding the contributing of our means on the first day of the week. He said, I gave order to the churches of Galatia. I'm giving the same order to you. Now, you take Acts 20 and 7, where they assembled on the first day of the week to break bread. You take 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, where they assembled on the first day of the week to contribute. And you see what they did on the first day of the week that was common to them and approved of God by apostolic authority. So following the apostolic and therefore divinely approved example or pattern of Christians in the New Testament, we know God approves of the observance of the, in the worship assembly of the saints on every first day of the week of the Lord's Supper and all the other acts of worship. Now you say, well, why, why is it that we can sing on Wednesday night and pray on Wednesday night and study the Bible on Wednesday night? Because you can do that anytime. <coughs> But you have specific authority to observe the Lord's Supper and the worship assembly of the saints only on the first day of the week. Isn't that hard? Now, we could go through all sorts of historical evidence, and I have excerpts from some here. And all of them testify to the fact that the church for years assembled on every first day of the week. But you don't need all of that when you have the pure authority of Jesus Christ Himself and it's His Supper and it's His New Testament and it's His instruction and we serve Him and you can't serve Him without obeying Him. So why do we need to go back to whatever they did after the first century? Well, we have what they did in the first century under apostolic guidance. B.W. Johnson in the People's New Testament had this to say, the early church writers from Barnabas, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus to Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and Cyprian, all with one consent declared that the church observed the first day of the week. They equally agreed that the Lord's Supper was observed weekly on the first day of the week. Now, if you want to do the detailed study, that's fine, but he summed it up, and that's the reason I chose to read him. Brother Johnson's People's New Testament, some of you may have that, I don't know. As you want to go back through various religious scholars dealing with the way it was in the first century churches taught the New Testament, they may not even practice it that way today, but they say that's the way it was done then. Don't quite ever understand that, but it shows their attitude toward the authority of the New Testament that they can say that's the way it was done then, perfectly acceptable with the apostles present, but we don't have to do it that way today. Well, if we don't have to do it that way today, what else do we not have to do since we're not going to accept the authority of the words of the New Testament is to determine what to do and what not to do. Now, there are those, and I've heard this all my life, that say that the weekly observance of the supper diminishes its importance. Thus, this is one reason they say, uh, there's the they say, engage in what they call uh, observance of the Lord's Supper monthly or quarterly or annually. But I want to know where anybody came up with the idea that the frequency of observance causes one not to appreciate it. Don't hug your wife, but once a year. Don't say thank you, but once a year. Assembling must be diminished too. So why do we assemble? Why don't we just assemble when we take the Lord's Supper lest the assembling and what's done in the assembling is diminished because we do it so often. What about singing praises and offering prayers and studying the Bible together? If you do it too often, is that going to diminish the importance of it? It seems like the Bible says we ought to be doing those things all the time every day. God has the right, the opposite view. The more time you spend with the right attitude in it, the better you're going to be. The devil comes along and says, don't oh, too close with it. It'll diminish its importance. The Lord's Supper is a very special memorial of His death for our sins. Our Lord Himself instituted it and He ordained His disciple to do it in His memory. And we show forth His death till He come again. Jesus told His disciples that He would not eat the elements again. Watch it. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. And as a side note, for those who still say the kingdom is somewhere out there, I advance that the kingdom's not the church and the church is not the kingdom, but they observe the Lord's Supper, 
they've got some things turned around. And the sad part about it is, they were observing the Lord's Supper 2,000 years ago in the Lord's church. So it must mean that the kingdom has come. Because Christ said, I'm not going to do it. He said, when I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. Mark 14, 25, that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And Luke 22, 16, it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And Luke 22, 18, the kingdom of God shall come. So when we observe the Lord's Supper properly as citizens of His kingdom, then we have fellowship with Christ the King and He with us. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. So it serves as a part of preparing us for the ultimate, final, eternal, glorified fellowship with Christ in heaven. Everything we do as a child of God is designed to get us from earth to glory. And so it is with this. The first Christians continued steadfastly in this observance, Acts 2.42. Because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. The early church convened on the first day of the week to break bread. I want to say a little bit more about that and then we'll be through. Break bread is a synecdoche. It stands for a part or a part for the whole. It stands for the whole or a part for the whole. In this case, to break bread is a part. We don't just come together, each get some bread, and say we're observing the Lord's Supper as we just break bread. If I were to ask you, would you come home and break bread with me? I think it's still it used to be more common than it is now. But I think you get the idea, I want you to come home and eat supper with me or dinner with me or whatever. So break bread stands for at least the whole of the Lord's Supper, even though it doesn't mention the fruit of the vine. My personal view is break bread stands for the whole worship done on the first day of the week, of which the Lord's Supper is an integral part. Because everything centers around what Christ did for us we couldn't do for ourselves in suffering, bleeding, and dying on the cross. Everything. But be that as it may, it's still where a part stands for the whole that came together on the first day of the week to break bread. The early church then did this. They did it with apostolic approval. They did it on every first day of the week. And by the way, the Greek language reads every first day of the week. But even though in English it says on the first day of the week, there's a first day of the week in every week, so what are you going to do every time the first day of the week comes around if you're a child of God? You're going to assemble with the saints and worship God in that assembly in the way the Lord has authorized you to worship Him in the five acts of worship. That's the reason we not forsake that assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. But exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the great exhortation that goes on as we from the heart participate in these acts of worship. Strengthen us to face the coming week. Christians today should never lose sight of the significance of the supper of the Lord. It is a constant reminder of the great sacrifice that Jesus made that our sins may be forgiven. It is a communion or a fellowship or a sharing of the body and blood of the Lord with fellow Christians. It's a time for self-examination and rededication for our service to the Lord. And it is a means of building fellowship with one another as members of the body of Christ. I hope this study of the Lord's Supper and how we're to remember our Lord as it is contrary to the way most people do it, will impress us on how different you will be simply by being determined to follow the authority of Christ and let men have their own way about things. We determined a long time ago to follow the teachings of the Scriptures and how to become a Christian. And the great plan of salvation is set out in believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins and confessing your faith in Christ and then qualifying be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you haven't done that, you're separated from God. You know you can't partake of the Lord's Supper. Oh, you say, well, I can. I'll show you. And it goes by. Well, why would you do that when you want Him to obey Him to become a Christian of Christ and gain all your sins or have all your sins remitted? Well, don't you see that's blasphemous? How does Christ think about that? Someone would partake of the Lord's Supper and have him obey the gospel. They're not converted to Christ. As a child of God, are you living for Christ? It's a time of self-examination, remember. 
So if you have sinned, you need to repent of it, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Everything works in the whole system of Christianity to remind us of our dependence upon the grace and mercy of God as extended through the gospel and to cause us to honestly evaluate ourselves. Every aspect of our service to God and our worship to God. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.